But I just want to begin with, a. I think this is the title probably obviates the need for content advice as such, but just to mention that this is a talk about, about rape and sexual violence and it doesn't contain any particularly graphic or detailed examples. Obviously, if anybody needs to take a break at any point, then feel very welcome. I won't, uh, I'll assume that you're not walking out in a half. And um, I, I believe we're going to have a five minute break after the talk and before questions. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for, for coming to hear about this. So a little bit of an outline of what I'm going to aim to do in the next kind of half hour to 40 minutes. I'm going to uh, give a brief overview of a few rape myths, uh, an attempt to kind of taxonomy. I'm going to uh, make the case, uh, I'm going to offer a way of thinking about rape myths as epistemic injustice, which I'll explain what that is. It's a philosophical concept. I'm going to also offer um, a way of thinking about rape myths as misogyny, um, which is a, is a word that is familiar, but the way I'll be thinking about misogyny comes from some specific philosophical work. And then I'll explore some upshots. So I just want to take a second to be a little bit more explicit about the kind of thing I'm attempting to do in this talk, because I think that philosophy can be lots of different things, can be undertaken in lots of different spirits. Um, so the spirit in which I mostly like to undertake philosophy is to look at the world and to look at the kind of things that seem to matter in the social situation that I find myself in and to see what, um, how I can help think through them and any ways in which I can sort of offer any kind of clarification or like insight. Um, but in this particular case, I want to be really clear about exactly what I think I can bring to the table here. I think that um, what I'm going to say in this talk is by no means a revolutionary perspective. For example, I do not think it is like groundbreaking news that we could think of rape myths as a form of misogyny. I think that, that is, is going to be a very unsurprising claim. Um, so I'm not aiming to claim that I have like insight into rape myths that will absolutely shake up how we might have thought about them before. The aim is to um, bring some do some clarifying work, uh, to make some of the kind of ways you might be already thinking about rape myths a bit more precise using some of the tools. Um, casting maybe a new light on what's already familiar and in the process I think illustrating some quite interesting philosophical tools and concepts that people are talking about at the moment. So that's sort of what's on the menu as it were. Okay. So here are some examples of rape myths. The first one is if someone dresses or acts in a sexually provocative way, they're to blame if they're raped. Here's another one. Rape always involves overwhelming physical force and a rape victim will always try to fight off their attacker. <coughs> Final one, women often lie about rape for revenge or because they regret having sex. So these are all examples of the kind of thing I have in mind when I say rape myths. Rape myths, I think, are things we, we encounter quite often. I think they're kind of around and circulating in the discourse, unfortunately. They also pop up in some quite specific places. So I don't know if anybody remembers this news story from a couple of weeks ago. This was a family um, court judge who uh, found that a woman hadn't suffered rape because she hadn't physically tried to make the sex not happen, even though she hadn't consented, which is obviously an incorrect application of the law and tallies with one of the rape myths that I just mentioned. It's not rape if you don't try and physically fight the person off. So I think that we, we find rape myths in some quite um, high profile places and in some quite powerful places, uh, as well as sort of um, in a more kind of common or garden way. So I think that's one reason why uh, they're very important and why I find them interesting to think about. And as we get more into the talk, I'll come back to this case because I'm interested in the ways that myths and misconceptions about rape can kind of exist alongside an, an, an accurate knowledge of the official detail of the law. I think that's, I think that's worth thinking about. So a couple of important um, caveats, I guess, or just things to, to say before I, I really get, get going on, on all of this. Um, my focus in this talk is on people perceived as women. Um, and... I want to acknowledge specifically that, that rape myths do affect men specifically and people who are perceived as men and people who are perceived as, as, as neither men nor as women. And I think that there are even some rape myths that are specific to men. Um, so it's not that I don't think this is worth talking about, it's just that's not what I'm talking about today because I think it needs a slightly different framing. So I'm focusing today on people perceived as women by whoever the person who holds the rape myth is, which might be the person themselves or it might be others. The second thing I want to be really explicit about, and I'll come back to this, is that the way in which rape myths are applied and mobilised and the kind of shape that they take is deeply intersectional. I think gender is really important to rape myths and what they are and how they work, but I don't think it's the only thing that matters, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that. So I want to say that I'm, I'm aiming mostly to take a broad brushstroke approach. I'm aiming to have it be the case that most of the things I say in this talk will be relevant to rape myths kind of across those other differences that intersect with gender, things like race, class, and so on. 
But I want to be really clear that I think that that is not an assumption you can just make at the beginning and then kind of not come back to. I don't think you can say, I'm talking about women in general and kind of not really think about that anymore. I think if one does that, there's always a danger that in talking about women in general, you end up implicitly centering the women who are most privileged. So I want to kind of, sort of an accountability thing, I want to kind of put that out there and that this needs constant checking on pain of ending up centering the most privileged women. I invite you to hold me to account if you feel like I'm doing that. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is just give a little bit of a, a taxonomy, I guess, of what I think are some kind of different families of rape myths, which will involve kind of going through some of the, some, some more examples beyond the ones we've already seen. So the first family of rape myths are what I think of as dishonesty myths. And this is basically rape myths to the effect that women frequently lie about rape. So you see how this is, this is kind of gender specific. So here's one. Women have consensual sex and then say it was rape to avoid sleeping like sluts. Women tend to lie about rape as a way of getting revenge on men. So I think these are a kind of a family of rape myths that centre around women as unreliable informers when it comes to rape and sexual violence more generally. Obviously, um, as I'm sure you know, these are not the way in which these are not grounded in, uh, in facts is, is pretty straightforward. False allegations of rape are no higher than any other crimes. Um, home office estimate is about 3%. Also, if you, if you did want to get revenge on somebody by accusing them of rape, You'd have to contend with the fact that less than 1.5% of the rapes that occur result in a criminal conviction. That's from the Home Office. So the vast majority are never reported, the vast, vast majority are never reported, and then at each stage there's an enormous drop-off. So if you take the kind of total that reach a criminal conviction from the total that we believe occur, it's about 1.5%. So con contrary to the idea that there are all these false allegations of rape constantly, constantly being made, in fact the very, the very opposite is true. Mostly it goes um, completely unreported. So that's dishonesty myths. The second kind of myths that I think, um, second kind of family of, of myths that I want to identify is what I'm calling consent myths. And these are basically rape myths that obscure or obfuscate or mislead as to what counts as consensual sex and what counts as rape. So here's there's quite a few examples, there's like more examples of these I think, there's more kind of different ones. Um, this isn't exhaustive, but here's one, consent cannot be withdrawn partway through a sexual act. Consent is automatically present if the people have recently had sex. We saw that one in the Julian Assange case, if you remember. Um, Non-consensual sex always involves overwhelming physical force, again. Um, and consent to one kind of sexual activity implies consent to other kinds of sexual activity. So I think what all of these do, I've called them consent myths because rape myths is kind of the umbrella term, so I need to differentiate them. But they, could, they are myths about what is consent and therefore what is the difference between rape and consensual sex. That's kind of what they, they kind of, they blur that line. They aim to obfuscate that line. I think they're actually closely related to dishonesty myths, the first kind, in the following way, because if a woman says that she's been raped and then describes something that her interlocutor does not consider to meet the criteria for being raped, for example, because um, it didn't involve overwhelming physical force, then she's going to seem like she's lying when she says that she's been raped, or like her claim that she's been raped and her description of the facts will be at odds from, that, from her, her listener's point of view. Um, so I think that we can kind of begin to build a picture of how these different kinds of rape myths interact. So just to, so with the, the last family of rape myths, we could see from some statistics that they were false and inaccurate. With this one, I think we just need to look really at the legal definition of consent um, in the law in the UK, which is better than it has been at other times in the UK. Um, so the legal definition of rape is that A rapes B, if and only if A intentionally penetrates the vagina, anus or mouth of B with his penis, and if B does not consent to the penetration, and A does not reasonably believe that B consents. So it has to, in fact, it has to be penetration, it has to be um, non-consensual, and there has to be an absence of reasonable belief in consent. It's a counterpart crime of sexual assault by penetration, whether penetration is by something other than a penis, um, which carries the same maximum penalty. There are other um, crimes around the area of sexual assault that are non-penetrative, but I think it's, it's fair to say that the crimes that involve penetration are kind of set slightly apart in law, and then within that, when the penetration's by a penis, that's set aside specifically as a category of rape. In terms of what consent is according to the law, B consents if they agree by choice and have the freedom and capacity to make that choice. So in terms of this law and in terms of the way that it's interpreted in case law, none of the, the myths that I, none of the claims that I went through on the previous slide, um, things like um, the, the idea that consent can't be withdrawn partway through a sexual act or that you can assume consent is present if the people have recently had sex, you sort of just really need to look at the definitions that we have to see that these are, these are false. Obviously that doesn't stop people like judges still holding those misconceptions of which more in a moment. 
But so that's consent myths. I think consent myths aim to kind of obscure what counts as consent and what counts as, as rape. So I want to flag, I've got a one more kind of taxonomy coming, but I think this is a good point to, one more kind of category in the taxonomy coming, but I think this is a good point to flag that I don't think this is totally exhaustive. So I think there are some rape myths that, that don't fit neatly into this three-way categorization, and that's fine. It's a messy phenomenon. I, I don't, I don't uh, think that you can capture it all with a perfectly neat one. But I want to flag up one kind of particularly ambiguous myth at this point, um, which is the idea that rape is almost always perpetrated by strangers. So obviously this is false. About 90% of cases of rape and sexual assault by penetration are committed by someone known to the victim. And in a 56% of cases of those, it's actually the current or former partner. So far from being something that's typically per uh, perpetrated by strangers, it's typically perpetrated by acquaintances and especially people very close to the victim. So you might think this sounds a bit like a dishonesty myth because it implies that women who claim they've been raped by an acquaintance are claiming something that's very unlikely and therefore their claim might be seen as more implausible. You might think it's a consent myth because it makes it seem as though sex between um, acquaintances or partners or former partners can't be rape. And I think I don't want to push it into one of the other categories. I think it's sort of doing a few different things at once and I'm fine with that. I just want to flag that one as one that doesn't super uh, fit into either of those two categories. And I don't think it fits into the third category either. And the third category that I'm interested in is, is what I'm going to call blame myths. And these are, as the name implies, basically rape myths that place the blame for rape on the person who is raped. So things like women who wear revealing clothing are to blame if they are raped. Women who drink alcohol or take drugs are to blame if they are raped. Women who flirt with men are to blame if they are raped. And women who take men home or go home with men or go to a private place with somebody um, are to, to blame if they're raped. I think, again, I don't want to suggest, I think these kind of, you, you, you can see even just from the phrasing that there's a kind of pattern of similarity between these myths, but I don't want to say they're completely in a, like a million miles away from the other, other categories. So if you think about the consent myths, um, I think these myths can often be ambiguous between saying, for example, women who wear revealing clothing are to blame if they're raped and saying, Women who blame revealing clothing are showing that they're up for sex by the clothing that they wear, so they've sort of consented so it wasn't rape. I think that there's a kind of slipperiness in how these manifest when people are um, excusing certain kinds of behaviour. But I think that certainly there's a kind of available way of framing these, these myths that, that's very much centred around blame. So that's why I kind of think that they cluster together. Okay. So that's by way of a bit of um, a taxonomy. So moving on now to think very briefly about the kinds of impacts that rape myths have. They obviously have um, an impact on general discourse. They, you find them in kind of newspaper reports. You find them in the ways that certain cases are talked about. You find them in the way that people talk about things that happen in their, in their friendship group or in their, their university or their workplace or whatever. You also find it in the criminal justice system. We saw that case of the, the judge who held the rape myth about rape needing to involve physical resistance in order to, to count as rape. Um, this, there's some evidence, some, some, good, some good evidence that rape myths, acceptance of rape myths affects what people, um, how people behave in kind of jury situations. People are more likely to acquit if they hold, uh, people who are accused of rape, if they hold a lot of rape myths. Jury trials are quite difficult to study because you can't do studies in the jury room. So what tends to happen there is that people set up a kind of pretend jury and um, with a pretend case and then run it with like slightly lots of different kind of variations in terms of the wording of how the, the case is described or how the jury is instructed. But obviously these are, um, I think it's fair to say, somewhat imperfect simulations of, of actual trials, but, but they do very much suggest that rape myths have um, a significant impact. Exactly how significant is debated, which is why I don't have stats on there. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the fact that rape myths have been shown to have an impact on survivors' own understandings of what's happened to them. It's a really interesting study. It's from the US by Peterson and Mullenhard in 2004. And what they found is that for certain rape myths, participants who... They basically... They, they looked at how a bunch of participants and how which rape myths they accepted. And it was also the case that they were, they were talking to people who were survivors of, of, of rape. And they found that some of the people who had reported an experience that met the legal definition of rape in the state that they lived in didn't describe themselves as having been raped. Okay, so they called that unacknowledged. So there was unacknowledged rape was when something had happened that met the definition, but they, um, the survivor didn't think of it as rape. They found that accepting certain rape myths made it the case that if a survivor had been raped in a way that corresponded to that myth, they were less likely to have acknowledged it. They were less likely to say that they'd been raped. And the rape myth that they found that for were two in particular. The first was a woman who was a woman who teases men deserves anything that might happen. So that's a blame myth. And the second one 
if a woman does not physically fight back, you cannot say it was rape. So that's a kind of consent myth. So they found for both of these myths, they seem to act as a block for people acknowledging, it was all women survivors, I should say, so women survivors acknowledging that what had happened to them constituted rape. I think that's really, I'm really interested in this, um, the way in which this particular impact of rape myths, perhaps more than the others, because I think, um, I think it is relevant across a lot of different ways that we could deal with justice. So you might have kind of deep-seated criticisms of our criminal justice system, of the whole concept of criminal justice as we practice it at the moment of prisons. You might have quite a thoroughgoing critique of that and you might want to implement a very different system, say of community accountability or something transformative or something quite radical. But you'd always, I think, I can't really imagine a situation where you wouldn't have to contend with the fact that if someone's own self-understanding is that what happened to them wasn't wrong, whatever process it is that you have to deal with that kind of thing in your society wouldn't be triggered or wouldn't be put into motion if people think that what happened to them wasn't wasn't wrong wasn't that thing so i think that the impact of rape on survivors own self-conceptualization of what happened to them is something that's going to be relevant across like a lot of very different ways the different societies that we might live in including some societies that we might want to bring about that's one reason i'm particularly interested in it okay so i'm going to talk now about Rape myths as what, what is called in philosophy epistemic injustice. So epistemic injustice comes from work by Miranda Fricker. The book's called Epistemic Injustice, Power and the Ethics of Knowing. And, rape, and epistemic injustice is, this is my paraphrase um, of what Fricker says, but it's basically practices of knowledge in which some people are prejudicially disadvantaged. Um, so for example, racism, sexism, operating on how we know and how we treat each other as knowers and how we communicate. And um, when, epistem when you say that to say that someone has been a victim of epistemic injustice is to say that they've been wronged in their capacity as a knower. They've been treated in a way that falls short of how we should treat each other, given that we're all subjects who, who are capable of knowledge. So um, epi epistemic injustices can involve things, as we'll see in a second, like not being believed. So if you're not believed about something important, then something bad might happen as a result of that. But the idea of epistemic injustice is that the mere fact of not being believed can be wrong, like an injustice in and of itself, kind of even like over and above the bad consequences that might follow. So this idea of not being believed is, is one of two different types or kind of subspecies of epistemic injustice that um, gets talked about, that, that Fricker uh, defined, which is testimonial injustice happens when someone is perceived as being less credible than they really are because of prejudice of some kind. So think of, if anyone's seen the film, The Talented Mr. Ripley. So um, Gwyneth Paltrow plays Marge Greenleaf, and when her fiancé, Dickie, is done away with by the eponymous Mr. Ripley, um, she kind of raises these suspicions to her perspective, the, the man who would have been her father-in-law, Herbert, Dickie's dad. Um, and and he, she says, oh, I think, you know, I think there's something dodgy going on. And he says, Marge, there's female intuition, and then there are facts. So he kind of says, look, you're just a woman having, being irrational and womanly. What, what you're trying to say is of no value. You're not a reliable testifier in this situation. Um, so that's an example of epistemic injustice. Because of prejudicial beliefs that Herbert Greenleaf holds about women, he doesn't take what Marge says seriously. He doesn't give the right amount of credibility to what she's saying. So I think that testimonial injustice, I think it's not a leap to see that testimonial injustice is, is highly relevant to dishonesty myths. So I think what's happening with dishonesty myths is that women as a group, as a kind of social kind or class, are considered untrustworthy regarding sexual violence. Um, perhaps considered untrustworthy in general, um, but I think even relative to that, I'm, that's a sort of different claim I'm not really making right now, but I think even if you think that women are socially considered untrustworthy in general, irrational or whatever in general, I think they're specifically considered especially untrustworthy and unreliable when it comes to, to sexual violence. And that's an example of testimonial injustice. Um, I think that brings out the ways in which epistemic injustice is a wrong over and above things might follow. So for example, if a woman is not believed when she says she's been raped, then perhaps um, her rapist will not be brought to justice. That's wrongful. But the fact of not being believed, Fricker tells us, is also wrongful. In that very moment of not being believed, she's not been given her due as a knower. So that's one kind of epistemic injustice. The second kind is um, what Fricker calls hermeneutical injustice. So it's slightly more complicated, but I think really important. So hermeneutical injustice, Fricker, Fricker, Fricker says, is having some significant area of one's social experience obscured from collective understanding owing to hermeneutical marginalization. I'm going to break that down with an example. <clears throat> 
This example Africa gives, which I think is a really good example, is people who suffered, women specifically, who suffered sexual harassment in the workplace before there was a concept of sexual harassment, before that was like a word that we had or a, a thing that we kind of recognize as a phenomenon. Okay. So this lack is, Frika says, and I, I think plausibly, this lack is a consequence of women not setting the terms of the conversation to the same extent as men, not having access to things like broadcast media, not having social power to kind of get their voices heard to the same extent. So that's the bottom bit. If I got a pointy thing? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, that's the hermit power. This is the hermeneutical marginalization. That's the hermeneutical marginalization bit. The second thing to note is that. Um, if a woman is sexually harassed and there's no concept of sexual harassment, what's she meant to do? She can say, I'm being bullied, he behaves in ways that make me feel uncomfortable. None of these seem to kind of get across the same thing that the concept of sexual harassment does. They might sound consistent with a range of much more trivial things, right? He makes me feel uncomfortable, that kind of puts the onus on her. So it's, it's just something about her experience that's important is not seen clearly if we don't have that concept. It brings something important into focus. And... Um, so that's the obscured from collective understanding bit. And finally, the idea is that this has a disproportionate negative impact on women. You might think if someone is a sexual harasser and they don't know what sexual harassment is, then that, like, that is worse for them. They, it would be better if they had that concept. They could learn. They could grow as a person. They could learn not to do that. But it's kind of more has a stronger negative impact on the people who are sexually harassed. And that is more, li more likely to be not only women, but more likely to be women. So that's the um, significant area of social experience. It's more significant. So that's what hermeneutical injustice in general is. And I think this is particularly accept, uh, um, applicable to consent myths, the myths that say, oh, this isn't rape really because blah, blah, blah. And I think I want to sort of distinguish two ways that this can work. I think hermeneutical injustice in these cases can, can be to do with having a faulty explicit understanding of the concept of, of rape or the concept of consent or a related concept. But I think it can also happen in a more kind of practical way that somebody has a problem practically applying the concept of, of rape or of consent. So I'm going to going to break that down. I've um, got a slide reminding us of the, the definition here, but I think I'll just move over, move, move on with that. So when hermeneutical injustice is explicit, I think it works something like this. So for example, until 1991, um, non-consensual sex wasn't a crime if the people were married to each other. So it was only within my lifetime that it became illegal for men to rape their wives. I think that's just a fact worth re returning to every now and again. Um, and so if that was the case, you might say, like, this, the law on rape was wrong. That's still rape. We want to say normatively, like, in terms of values and what, what, what's, what's okay and what's not, that was still rape, but the law explicitly said a different thing. So that, I think, is an example of hermeneutical injustice happening quite explicitly. People hold a faulty concept. People say what's rape, and people say, oh, it's non-consensual like, non sex between people who are not married, right? That's a problem. But if that's the only way that hermeneutical injustice came into the picture here, I think it wouldn't be applicable to that many cases of rape myths now, because like, if you remember that case where the judge um, held the view that if it didn't involve physical resistance, it couldn't be rape, well, that person, I think, probably knows what the law says. I think we can probably be clear that that... I, mean, I agree, no, fair point, fair point. But let's suppose, let's take the charitable view and suppose that person could tell you what the law, the words that were in the law. But they've clearly gone way off when it comes to actually applying it to a practical case. And so I think that that seems a bit different from the sexual harassment example. And the sexual harassment example that Fricker uses to illustrate what hermeneutical injustice is, the idea is that no one's come up with the right word yet. Like it hasn't, it's just like if someone says what's sexual harassment, everyone goes, oh, I don't know, what's that? I never heard of it. Um, so there's an explicit lack, but I think what's happening in a lot of cases where rape myths are kind of mobilized in practice is that people know in the abstract what rape is but they or what consent is, but they're applying it all wrong. And so that's why I think there's a kind of implicit, what I'm calling a kind of implicit version of hermeneutical injustice, which is basically um, not being able to apply. The thought here that I kind of want to draw out is the idea that not being able to apply a concept properly is a way of holding a faulty concept. So one way of holding a faulty concept of rape is if you would explicitly say, if asked, oh, it's not rape if she's your wife. 
Another way of holding a faulty concept of rape is to be able to say the right definition or the legal definition or a good definition if asked, but when you have to apply it to particular cases, the results that you give are off in a, in a patterned way, in a way that's not just accidental, that's kind of follows a certain pattern. So philosophers, I mean, I think the point kind of gets across without the language, but if you want the philosophical language here, um, many philosophers would say that the manifest concept is the concept that we would define if we were asked to. So the manifest concept of rape is what people say if you say, tell me what rape is. But the operative concept is something like the concept that would be extrapolated from our actual practices. So if you watch people going around applying the concept of rape and try to reverse engineer an account of what it was from that, you'd end up with the operative concept. So what I'm saying here is that when rape myths that exist alongside a good or a better kind of formal or legal definition of rape are in play, what we've got is people holding faulty operative concepts of rape. Okay. So we're halfway through the outline that I gave, but more than quite a lot more than halfway through the talk, so don't worry. So I've given you a kind of overview of a couple of different types of rape myths. And I've sort of looked at the first two with this idea of epistemic injustice. I've tried to say that dishonesty myths sort of come, come under the idea of testimonial injustice and that consent myths come under the idea of hermeneutical injustice. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about misogyny and about some upshots of all of this. So misogyny is, unlike epistemic injustice, it's a, it's a word that we, we use all the time and it's kind of um, a layperson's word, if you will, but there's been some really interesting recent philosophical work specifically on misogyny that I want to bring in here. And this is from Kate Mann's excellent book, Down Girl, The Logic of Misogyny. So according to Mann, misogyny should be understood as the law enforcement branch of a patriarchal order, which has the overall function of policing and enforcing its governing ideology. So the thought is that we come to act in patterned ways that uphold a system of, of male dominance, a patriarchy, and we, that happens through all sorts of kind of subtle ways that sort of nudge us into certain kinds of things because they seem like the easiest thing. But sometimes when someone steps out of line, they have to be put back in their place. It's a kind of like a crackdown response. It's the kind of law enforcement response. Um, and that's when that happens, the kind of we need to put women back in, like someone is trying to put women back in their place, man thinks that that's the kind of something we should reserve the word misogyny for. That's a good way to use that word. And I agree, I think it's a helpful certainly a helpful and insightful thing to pick out. So for man, a social environment is misogynistic when girls and women, or some subset of girls and women, not all instances of misogyny target all girls and women at once, face hostile social forces, and those forces affect them because they're girls or women. And furthermore, that what those hostile forces, social forces do is they serve to police and reinforce a patriarchal social order, so a social order of male dominance. And man acknowledges, and I think this is really important, that this, such orders are always intersectional in nature. They're never, we don't just live in a patriarchy, we also live in a white supremacy, we also live in a, a society structured by all sorts of class domination. It's never, just, it's, like, it's never just gender, and I think that that is something I very much agree with, and um, which I'll come back to in a second. So I think misogyny in, in this sense that's helpfully defined by, by man is helpful for understanding um, some other kinds of, of um, rape myths, specifically the ones I haven't talked about yet, the blame myths, the she was asking for it kind of myths. And I think that um, the way I would like to think about this is to posit, I guess, a patriarchal norm. So misogyny is what happens when norms of patriarchy are threatened. It's like a kind of corrective response. So what's the norm that's kind of being threatened? I think the, the patriarchal norm that, that rape myths are, are kind of upholding and policing is that women are not entitled to control when and with whom they have sex. That's the norm, I think, that uh, rape myths function to uphold. But what's interesting about this is I think that if you look at how gender inequality and gender hierarchy work, and if you look at kind of how patriarchal societies operate, I don't think it's plausible to, to posit, I don't think it would be plausible to posit a norm that's like any man is entitled to have, any, have sex with any woman at any time, whenever. Because patriarchy is also about policing men's access to certain women and kind of protecting <coughs> that, right, from other men. So I think that under, according to patriarchal norms, please don't read any of this as like what I actually think is the moral truth, under patriarchal norms, certain men are entitled to sex, have sex with certain women. 
but not all men and all women, right? So husbands are entitled to have sex with their wives would be a kind of classic uh, example. And we saw that that was indeed the law in, in this country until quite recently. So I think that what's going on with blame myths is I think blame myths target girls and women for objecting to sex, which men are socially entitled to under patriarchy. I think that is the way in which they serve as misogyny in, in man's sense. And there's two reasons why I think that this is a particularly plausible <coughs> explanation of what's going on. There's two kind of features of um, blame myths that I think this like captures quite nicely. The first is that I think that rape by a stranger is the least subject to blame myths. I think the cases where women are raped by total strangers are the ones least likely to come under a kind of she was asking for it framing. Not unlike, not like, it's not like that doesn't happen at all. Stuff about alcohol, stuff about clothing, but that's definitely a thing. But I think it's less, um, I don't have the stats to hand, apologies, but I think that rapes by strangers have higher conviction rates than rapes by acquaintances, which kind of bears in with that. So if you think of that in terms of like, not all men are entitled to have sex with any woman according to patriarchy, then I think that makes sense. And I also think that the intersectional nature of rape myths um, fits with this well, by what, which I mean um, sort of drawing on work here by people like Angela Davis and Kimberley Crenshaw, about the ways in which a lot of rape myths are quite highly racialized. Um, uh, black men uh, accused of rape against white women are kind of subject to um, negative prejudicial stereotypes about black men as predators. Um, black women uh, receive even less kind of belief and support than white women when they're saying that they have been raped. Um, that comes from work by Kimberley Crenshaw. And if you think about rape myths as racialized in these kind of ways, that makes sense too, because we also live, we don't just live in a patriarchy, we live in a, a white supremacist patriarchy. And under a white supremacist patriarchy, white men's sexual access to women from minority, marginalized, like subordinated racial groups is protected and upheld to a greater extent. Um, it's not symmetrical in terms of race and gender, the kinds of uh, types of entitlement that are protected by social norms and by, by laws. Um, so I think that both of those dynamics support the idea that rape myths are, blame myths specifically, are kind of um, targeting girls and women for objecting to sex to which men are socially entitled under patriarchy. If, for example, under a white supremacist patriarchy, black men are not really entitled to have sex with white women, and then you would expect that white women who say they've been raped by black men would be subject to less um, rape myths and less hostile responses. Um, than in other, other cases. So that is the way I think that misogyny explains blame myths, which were the third kind of rape myth that I identified. So I've kind of gone through all of the, all of the myths and I have just under five minutes left. So I'm gonna briefly say something about the upshots of this. I was aiming to come in under the 40 minutes, but I have like failed in that objective, apologies. Um, so one thing that I think, as I said, I don't think that any of this is like astonishingly groundbreaking. I don't think it's, a massive revelation that misogyny plays a role in, in rape myths. Um, so I don't think there's any grounds here for like completely revolutionizing the way that people campaigning against rape myths and um, resisting rape culture are going about what they're doing. I think this is broadly like confirms what people engaging in those struggles are already doing. But there's some things that I think it kind of underlines and here's, here's those things. So I think this indicates that strategies for tackling rape myths are gonna be more effective if they take into account the ways in which rape myths are instances of epistemic injustice and the ways in which they're instances of misogyny. So about epistemic injustice then, I think what this suggests is that education about rape myths shouldn't just involve telling people what the definition of rape and consent are. They should involve um, supporting and encouraging people to actually apply those concepts by thinking about particular cases. Because if you have a concept, you can tell us what the concept says, but you can't apply it, then you don't really have the concept. You don't have the operative concept is kind of missing or potentially faulty. And I think the idea here is that this kind of practical, um, engaged thinking about rape and consent, uh, education is going to need to involve that um, in order to properly reverse the distortion of the concept of rape, targeting that implicit hermeneutical injustice that I described. The second upshot is that I think education about rape myths is going to need to be embedded in broader education aimed at combating misogyny, combating gender inequality and male dominance of all kinds, bearing in mind that that's intersectional. Um, it, it has to target those norms of male entitlement, those norms of male sexual entitlement, again, which are classed and racialized in all sorts of ways, because those norms are kind of underpinning and motivating those rape myths, I think. That, that insofar as the rape myths are misogyny, they're a corrective policing re re response 
to a perceived like norm violation. And I think unless you're targeting those norms that are allegedly being violated, then you're not going to be getting to the root of the problem. So I think that um, education about, about rape consent, including aimed at rape, combating rape myths, is going to be needed um, to be embedded in a broader kind of anti-sexist, gender egalitarian program in order to be effective, um, both in general and explicitly in relation to, to sex. So I think that, um, I don't really have time to go into it, but I think that in the current moment where we're seeing some compulsory sex and relationships education being brought in, but um, the content of that is kind of left quite vague, um, it's not clear that all young people have access to it. I think that there's, there's, it might not be news, perhaps, that these things are kind of needed in order to combat rape myths, but certainly the will to actually implement that is not, is not there in the way that I would like to see it. So that's why I think this is um, an important issue. So I had a, a slide saying what I did, but I think I will leave that there. And thank you very much.